So today's lecture is going to be on the membrane, um, its structure, and its function. So first we're going to describe the membrane as being selectively permeable. Sometimes you'll also see that written as semi-permeable. Um, that just means that it's only allowing certain things through the membrane. So it basically lets some things go straight across, some things have to go through certain channels, we'll call those protein channels, and some things can't get through at all. And that actually allows the cell to control what's going in and out of it very easily. Um, if that membrane wasn't selectively permeable, things would just be moving back and forth kind of at will, and that's not really good for the cell. So that would make the water concentration different. It could cause the cell to burst. It could cause the cell to lose nutrients it needs. So um, it's really important that the cell is able to control that. Now, the cell is not conscious. The membrane is not conscious. It does not have a brain. It's not thinking. It's not deciding what's going to go through. Um, there's going to be other factors that are going to decide what things can go in and out or across a membrane. And the number one factor there is going to be polarity, which is why we said we have to know what that is. Um, as far as modeling the membrane, our most recent model is called the fluid mosaic model. We're going to look at that now. The very first model of the membrane um, was in 1935 by two men, Davison and Danielli, and they called their model the sandwich model. Um, and you can see that model pictured here. Um, it did include the phospholipid bilayer here, and it did include proteins, which are these kind of purple clumps here. Um, now their model is called the sandwich model because if you think of like a ham sandwich, um, the proteins are all touching, you can see, kind of like a big loaf of bread and they are totally covering the top and the bottom. That would be like the bread portion, and then the ham part would be these middle phospholipid um, you know, bilayer there focusing on each other. So this was kind of one of the first go at what the membrane could look like. Um, at this point in 1935, we didn't have great microscope technology. Um, luckily for us, now we do, and cells are big enough, they're actually bigger than atoms, that we can see a cell live. We can see what it looks like. So that gave us some insight into what the cell actually looks like and how it functions. So a technique was developed called, called the freeze fracture method um, that allowed us to look at the interior of a membrane. Again, we're looking live, we're looking with a microscope. So what they did is they took a cell and they froze it. They froze it basically with liquid nitrogen like you've, you've seen people do with you know shoes or bananas and they crack open. Um, this time they did it with a cell and they very carefully kind of, you can see here, peeled the two bilayer apart and then they looked at them under a microscope and that's what you're looking at down here and what they discovered was not only that the proteins are not fully covering the top and bottom like in the sandwich model that some of them actually go through so they're able to see that the proteins actually go through this the whole membrane itself and that led them to discover transmembrane proteins like we're going to talk about and some other components of the membrane that we now know of and again we call this model the fluid mosaic model fluid meaning movable kind of like water is fluid. So we know that a cell is not rigid. The cell membrane is not rigid like a cell wall. It can bend, it can move a little bit. That's the fluidity of it. And mosaic, kind of like a mosaic tile structure where it's made of all these different pieces. So you see here, you have the bilayer, which is actually the same as it was in the sandwich model, the two layers facing each other. And then all these purple things are proteins. So notice they're not totally covering the top and bottom of it. Um, they're actually kind of more sporadically spread out, and some of them actually go straight through the membrane. So comparing the two models, um, you know, 1935, not a bad model for what they had available. Uh, Davison, uh, Davison and Danielli were right about the phospholipid bilayer, so you can see that really hasn't changed, you know, from the new model to the old. The biggest difference is going to be those proteins. Um, the fact that they, number one, are not totally covering the top or bottom. Um, some of them are on the bottom, some of them are on the top only, but a great many of them go straight through the membrane, and that's going to help with their function. So this graphic here is a pretty up-to-date model uh, picture of what the membrane looks like. We're kind of getting a side view of the membrane. So here is the phospholipid bilayer here. Um, this is the outside of the cell, so we call that the extracellular matrix. Here's the inside of the cell. You'll see there's lots of these rope-looking things. And um, we'll talk about what those are. Those are for anchoring the cell. Your cells are not just kind of free-floating through your body. They're kind of anchored where they should be. And then we have also some other pieces that make up the mosaic portion that we're going to kind of talk about one at a time. So you can see cholesterol, carbohydrates. Um, you can see peripheral proteins versus integral proteins. Um, glycolipids, glycoproteins. We're going to talk about all these pieces and, and what their role is. So starting with kind of the basics, the, the kind of the 
anchor point of the cell membrane, and that is that phospholipid bilayer. Um, bi meaning two, so it is two double layers of phospholipids. You have these phosphate heads, the gray that is on the top and the bottom, and then you have the lipid tails, which are the yellow things which are facing each other. So they're kind of opposites, almost like if you want to think of an Oreo cookie. So you can see kind of a more molecular view of the phosphate heads here and then the fatty acid tails. Um, and because it is a phospholipid, um, it is both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. We use a term amphipathic to describe something that is both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. So the reason why or the way that works is at a molecular level, the phosphate heads are polar, so they're hydrophilic, and the lipid or fatty tails are hydrophobic. They're nonpolar and hydrophobic. It's important that the very inside and outside of the cell is hydrophilic because they're in watery environments. So if they were hydrophobic, it, you would have some issues with the cell just existing where it exists. And then the hydrophobic interior tails is really going to help prevent certain things from going across the membrane. So think like wax paper we talked about, the, that coating like wax seals for the car. It's not going to allow polar things to go straight through, and that's going to be important later on. Of course, in a perfect world, we have a membrane that looks like this, right? All those fatty acid tails straight, and everything is pushed together as it can be, as tight as it can be, so there's a real nice tight seal. Um, this does happen sometimes, mostly if you have all saturated hydrocarbons. Um, some things can go wrong, though. So, for example, if you have an unsaturated hydrocarbon tail, which you're going to look at here, if you remember, an unsaturated hydrocarbon has at least one double bond, which causes the, the, the fat to kind of kink. So you see this little bend, and you see what it does is it physically pushes away the phospholipid that's next to it. Um, the reason why we don't like that is you see there's a hole here. So there's kind of a hole in the membrane. So it's like a hole in the seal. Not good. We don't like that. Um, so again, that can happen when you have an unsaturated hydrocarbon. It can also happen at different temperatures. So in general, the higher the temperature, the more fluid and kind of sealed up the membrane is. The lower the temperature, you're going to get some of these kind of pieces that cause the membrane to have some holes. Luckily, we have a little molecule called cholesterol that everyone thinks is, you know, bad. Cholesterol is so terrible for you. But actually, cholesterol is a vital part of keeping your cell membranes really nice and tight and kind of intact. So you see these holes here up at the top, are filled with the cholesterol molecules. So the cholesterol molecules kind of come in and plug up those holes, you can see right here, and they kind of shift the phospholipids back into that nice pretty layer where there is no gaps in the membrane. So too much cholesterol, not great. You know, that, that will give you, you know, some heart disease issues, but you do need some cholesterol in your diet to kind of help um, basically plug up the holes of your, of your cell membranes. So there are two main types of membrane proteins. Um, the integral, like think about integrated, goes straight through. And the peripheral, think about your peripheral vision. Those are either totally on the inside or the outside. Um, their function is going to be different because of where they're present. So, for example, peripheral proteins have a lot to do with identification of a cell, um, kind of tagging it, if you will. They also have some to do with some chemical reactions that happen in a cell. Whereas integral proteins, if you look, it kind of looks like a tunnel. Um, and it, that's really what it does, is it allows things to kind of tunnel through the membrane. So, for example, water, which does need to move through the membrane, can't go straight through because of that hydrophobic interior. So the integral protein kind of acts as a tunnel, exactly like a tunnel works, you know, to go over a body of water, under a body of water, and allows the water to go through. Now, in every drawing you're going to see of a protein, they're going to look like these kind of chunky purple things. Um, I just want to make sure you know they don't really look like that. So if you're looking at these proteins on a molecular level, they are not chunks of purple. They're not blobs, Play-Doh blobs of purple things. They are proteins. So this picture here is trying to show you, right here, these alpha helices. So alpha helix, one of the protein folding type of things. So what a protein is, you know, a, pro a membrane protein, is a series of these alpha helix, you know, secondary structure of proteins kind of squished together. Um, they're not these kind of blobs like they look like in the drawings. They're made up of these 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 um, these coils, um, and they do have hydrophobic and hydrophilic parts as well, just because you know they don't want to let everything through, so they still need to be selectively permeable themselves. 
Again, the main, main function of a protein, you remember, is going to be that transport, but they do some other things. So um, they have to do with enzymes and enzymatic activity and chemical reactions that are happening, you know, inside and kind of on the outside of the cell. They have to do with signal transduction. So you're going to see when we get to that unit how they pass messages not only to each other, but from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. They have to do with cell-to-cell -cell recognition. So that's, that has to do a little bit with your immunity. So it's kind of a tag on the cell that says, hey, I'm a liver cell. I'm supposed to be here. Don't kill me. Could also be the opposite of that. Hey, you're a virus. I don't recognize you, and, and your body will attack it. Um, intercellular joining is basically just gluing or attaching the cells together. So remember, your liver is made up of a bunch of cells that are kind of all hooked together, and they do that with that intercellular joining. Kind of in the same scope, they help join the cell to what we call the extracellular matrix. That's why you don't get liver cells in your lungs. Um, your liver cells kind of stay in that spot where your liver is supposed to be because it's attached to your extracellular matrix. Your organs aren't really just floating around. They're actually physically attached to, to the matrices and kind of the, the tissue of your body. Carbohydrates is the next kind of piece of the puzzle here. Um, the carbohydrates are right here. You can see they kind of have those ring structures that we know that are classic carbohydrate. They are not really green, but you're often going to see them depicted as green, which I like because the role of carbohydrates is actually for direction, kind of telling um, not only the cell, but also molecules where to go. So you see here, this carbohydrate is kind of just hanging on the outside of the cell. So that carbohydrate is probably identifying the cell, you know, saying, hey, I'm a liver cell or whatever the cell type might be. You can see this carbohydrate is actually going to be attached to a protein, and that's probably telling the molecules where to go. So for example, if this particular protein was what we call an aquaporin, which allows water through, it, this little tag here, this carbohydrate tag, is kind of identifying for the waters, hey, you can come here. So again, I always think of these as like the road signs, like the Middletown exit or the Wilmington exit. It's kind of given directionality of where things need to go for the cell. So we're going to say that the cell is going to have sidedness, or you're going to see some sometimes it's called compartmentalization. Um, most pictures you see of the cell, everything's nice, evenly spaced. It's this pretty even thing, and that's really not how it works in the real world. Number one, cells are what we call specialized, so we're going to see they don't even have all the same pieces. But the other part is they're going to have sides or compartments or certain areas. So you can see here, this is what we talked about before. This is the creation of, you know, proteins and stuff that are going to be exported out of the cell. So you see the ER here. Here's some vesicles. Here's the Golgi. And remember that these vesicles need to go out the membrane. So they need to kind of attach to the membrane and be released. Notice you don't really have membrane proteins in that area where the vesicles are attaching to. And the reason for that is they would get kind of stuck. Like the membranes would almost block the vesicles from being to release their pieces. So where you're going to see the Golgi in this kind of process of protein release taking place, you're not going to see a lot of, of transmembrane proteins. There probably is another side of the cell that maybe has to do with water intake where you're going to see a lot of aquaporin. So these things are not evenly spaced. Um, you know, certain areas of the cell do certain things, and that's where you're going to see a lot of these certain types of, of membrane pieces. So again, the selective permeability of the membrane really has to do with polar, nonpolar, hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions. Um, the only things that can go straight across the membrane, just kind of glide straight across, are very small, and we're going to say nonpolar molecules. So for our purposes, which is not totally 100% true, but for our purposes, we're going to say that only CO2, carbon dioxide gas, and O2, oxygen gas, can go straight across the membrane. Both of those molecules are extremely small, so they're very, very small. They can kind of, if you want to think about it, slip through the cracks, the very small cracks in the phospholipid bilayer, and they're also nonpolar, so that nonpolar interior is not going to mess with them. Every other molecule is going to be prevented by the hydrophobic core from moving straight across the membrane. It doesn't mean they don't go across. It means they cannot go back and forth at will. So that hydrophobic core is going to prevent ions, polar molecules, um, almost everything besides O2 and CO2 from going straight across. What they're going to need is they're going to need those transmembrane proteins. They're going to need those integral proteins to kind of act as a tunnel or a passageway through the membrane. And again, the whole point of this is that's allowing the cell to control what's coming in and out of the cell more easily. 
So there's two main ways that things can move across a cell membrane. Um, the two kind of categories are called passive transport and active transport. Um, the difference being active transport here is going to require energy. You see right here this ATP molecule, that is the energy molecule. So in order to move actively, you must have energy. In order to move passively, you don't need the energy. Um, and the way that works is I want you to think of a river, a river with a current. If you got in a boat and sat in the river and you went with the current, you wouldn't have to paddle at all. You wouldn't have to expel any energy. So what's going to happen is you're just going to kind of ride the current down the river. But if you had to go the opposite way, if you had to go against the current, you would have to paddle a lot. You have to expel a lot of energy to get going against the current. That's kind of what happens here, but instead of current, we're going to talk about a concentration gradient, which is how much stuff is on either side. So if you look in all the passive transport examples, there is more stuff, so you can see here the purple dots, right, the orange triangles and the, and the blue dots, there's way more stuff on the outside of the membrane than there is on the inside. So that means the concentration of solute or the concentration of particles is higher outside the cell in each of these cases here. So if it's higher outside and lower inside, that is the concentration gradient. Things always move from high to low. I think we've talked about heat before, moving from high heat to low heat. So this is the same kind of thing just with particles. So the gradient is always going to move from high to low. So this would be like the current, right, the current in the river. So passive transport is when these three things are going to move in that same direction. They're going to ride the gradient. They're going to ride the current of the river, which means they don't need to expel any energy to move. Active transport, if you look, especially the orange squares, there is less this time on the outside than on the inside. So if they, the orange squares want to move in, they're actually going against the concentration gradient. They're moving from low to high. So think about that like against the current. So in that case, you would have to paddle the boat, and which is going to expel energy, and that's active transport. Um, the types of passive transport, so we're kind of like categorizing here. Diffusion is the term for something that's just going to move straight across the membrane. Um, remember, you have to be very, very small and nonpolar to be able to pass right through the actual membrane. We talked about the only two things pretty much in our world that we're going to say do that is CO2 and O2. So what would happen there is they just very simply move through the, the phospholipid bilayer. They're kind of small enough to sneak in between um, the, the small spaces in the bilayer. The more common type of passive transport is going to take advantage of proteins. So you see here, these are intermembrane proteins, and we call this facilitated diffusion. So it's still diffusion. It's still passive transport. That's a point of confusion sometimes. Kids get confused at a facilitated diffusion because things are going through the, the protein that is active. It's still passive transport. It's just facilitated or kind of helped along by these, these intermembrane proteins. And then again, active transport is going to require energy and move from low to high. So again, diffusion is a type of passive transport. It is where the particles are going to move straight across the phospholipid bilayer. Um, this slide here is trying to show you that diffusion never stops. Um, particles are actually moving in and out of the cell um, all the time. Kind of think of it like air molecules do the same thing. So what we talk about in terms of diffusion is something called net diffusion. So if you see this picture, yes, there's some orange going this way and purple going this way, um, but the net diffusion is the overall movement. So what you want to get to usually is this place called equilibrium. Um, that is where there is still movement of particles, but there's no what we call net movement. Um, more particles aren't going one way or the other. It's equal. It is equalized. And that's kind of always the goal of the cell. They want to have equal concentration on both sides of the cell membrane. So osmosis is a particular um, type of passive transport. It's actually a particular type of facilitated diffusion in which we're just going to talk about the movement of water. So osmosis is the diffusion of water in particular. Um, we're going to remember that water is polar, so it's not going to be able to diffuse straight across the phospholipid bilayer. Um, that is why water needs to be facilitated. It goes through a protein. Um, in particular, the name of the protein that it goes through is called an aquaporin. So that is a protein, intermembrane protein that is specific to water movement. Um, and again, water is going to flow um, to equal or equilibrate inside and outside the cell. The hardest part about osmosis and understanding osmosis is, for the most part, when you are having movement of water, 
there is an uneven concentration on either side of the membrane. So if you see this U-tube here, you see that there's the green particles and there's more green particles on this side than this side, which means there is a higher concentration on this side of the U-tube than on this side. In the cases of osmosis, the green particles cannot move through the membrane. So even with a membrane protein, even with active transport, those green particles, usually they're too big. They can't get through the membrane. The cell still wants to even out the concentration. So what it can do is if it can't move the green solute particles, it'll move the water. So it'll move the water through an aquaporin. So if you want to think about, you know, you take a sip of lemonade and the lemonade's way too strong. Um, you can't really take out the lemonade mix. You've already dissolved the powder. But if you add more water, that will change the concentration of the lemonade and make it, you know, dilute it and make it taste better. So that's what happens with osmosis. Because the green solute can't move, the water's going to move. Um, and then the hard part is water, just like everything else, is going to move from high to low concentration. But the concentration of solute is going to be opposite the concentration of water. So if you look here, there is a lower concentration of solute. There's less green dots. So over here, the concentration of solute is low. Over here, the concentration of solute is high. You have more green dots. But the opposite is true as far as the concentration of water. And you can kind of see that in the picture. You see kind of like the amount of blue available. So on the left side here, if the solute is low, the water concentration is higher. There's more water on this side. And vice versa on this side, if the solute concentration is high, there's less water. And this is going to be important because osmosis is the movement of water in particular. And water is going to move from high water concentration to low water concentration. So the water is actually going to move in this direction. This is where the water is higher. This is where it's lower. It's going to move to the right. Um, so the confusing part is it's, it's not the solute concentration. It's not moving high to low solute. It's high to low water. And you can see the result here is this side has way more water. Um, but the concentration of the solution is now going to be the same. So less solute particles, less water is needed, and then vice versa. So where this comes to play, especially in biology in your body, uh, part of being dehydrated and make sure you're having, drinking enough water, is that cells will react if they're not in the proper watery environment where that concentration is not correct. So we can describe the external environment of a cell as hypotonic, see here, isotonic or hypertonic. One of the most important kind of things to remember is when we use these three words, we're referring to the external environment only. So you are not going to really ever describe the internal environment of the cell as hypotonic. If you say the word hypotonic, you mean the outside of the cell. So the absolute perfect you know, situation for an animal cell is this isotonic solution. Isotonic means that the concentration of the water, the watery environment, the solution, inside and outside the cell is the same. So when there's an exact equal concentration, the net diffusion is zero. There's really kind of just as much water moving out as in. So you have this perfect environment where you're not getting water, you know, rushing in or rushing out. That's what all cells, animal cells want to be in. So remember when you go to the hospital for dehydration or if you need a fluid bag, they're putting in, an, they usually sometimes it's called an isotonic fluid. They're putting in a fluid that is exactly equal to the concentration inside your cell. So this is what the body wants. This is where you want to live, this isotonic. For various reasons, sometimes your body can turn what we call hypotonic. So remember, hypotonic is going to refer to the exterior only. I want you to think hypo, like hypothermic, like you're cold, like your temperature's low. So hypotonic means the outside is less concentrated than the inside. So what will happen then, right, because things are going to move low to high, the water's going to move in. You might be saying, wait, you just said low outside. The hypotonic is referring to the solute. So remember, if the solute's low on the outside, hypo low, the water's high on the outside. So the process of osmosis, the water's going to move from high to low. So the water's actually going to move into the cell. It can have so much water moving into the cell that the cell will burst. Remember that word we use is to cut or to lice. So that can happen where, where if you're in a hypotonic environment for too long, your cells can actually start bursting. And they die, obviously, when they burst. 
the opposite side of that is hypertonic. I want you to think hyper, like hyperactive. That is where the solute outside is too, is too high. It's much higher on the outside. So remember, if the solute's high out, the water's low out. So in that case, the water will move out of the cell. The cell will shrivel up. Um, it won't be as bouncy and nice, and that'll kind of mess up some of the organelle function. Now, this is not always true for plant cells. It's not kind of the quite um, a keen environment for a plant cell. So a plant cell actually doesn't want to be isotonic. Um, a plant cell actually likes to live in the hypotonic environment. So again, the description is the same though. Hypo, low, low solute outside, high water outside. So the water will move in. <clears throat> and you need to remember that a plant cell is inside a cell wall. So in order to get that plant to look nice and, and full and bouncy, what happens is the more water that goes into the cell makes it kind of push out, makes it very kind of bigger than normal, almost like a balloon, and that provides a stability in the plant cell. So a plant cell actually wants to be hypotonic. That is why you water a plant with pure water, because pure water basically has no solute in it, so it's hypotonic, so it's going to move in. We call that turgor or turgor pressure. Um, we, a plant wants to be turgid, so a plant likes to live in a hypotonic environment. In an isotonic environment where the solution's equal, we say that the cell is flaccid. So that's when the cell or the plant starts to look a little withered. It's not dead. It's not brown. It just looks a little wrinkly, a little withered. You need to add water because you need to move it into the hypotonic. And then, of course, it doesn't want to live in hypertonic. It doesn't want to live where the concentration's way higher. So, for example, if you watered plants with salt water, um, what's going to happen is it's going to pull the water out of the plant cell. And we call that, the term there is plasmalized. So the cell will kind of shrivel the same. We don't really call it shrivel, though. We call it plasmalized. So there is a chance that you're going to see a problem on your test for something called water potential. Um, I don't want you to panic. I know it's a weird symbol there. Um, water potential, I want you to think of it as the potential of water to move. Like how likely is it that water is going to move from one place to another? Um, the little pitchfork thing you see here is a symbol. It's a Greek symbol. I always remember because I think it looks like... Um, a trident, like King Triton and the Little Mermaid, kind of looks like a trident, has to do with water, Little Mermaid. That's kind of the symbol that, that you use for that. <clears throat> now, things really different. Um, we just said all things are going to move from high to low concentration, and it's the same with water potential. Water will always move from high water potential to low water potential. The kind of new thing is going to be you can calculate water potential if you are given something called solute potential, or pressure potential. Um, pressure potential is going to be the physical pressure on solution, kind of like air pressure. Um, so the pressure potential pretty much always has to be given to you in a problem. You can't really measure that or calculate that. So the one thing that you're going to see that's going to change is the solute potential. Solute potential is just another term for solute concentration. So it's just going to give you a number of how concentrated the solute in is. And then what you do is you add that together to get the, the, the water potential value. Um, just some kind of general things. Pure water has a pressure potential of zero. Uh, plant cells have a pressure potential of about one because they're going to have some of that concentration. Um, you will be given this equation. It's not super likely you're going to see these problems. We will practice these problems together, so don't panic. Um, but in general, if you just remember, water potential is kind of like how likely is it the water, that the water is going to move or which direction is the water going to move in. It's always going to go high to low. The way less likely problem that you may see is calculating the solute potential. So this, the trident S, was actually in the previous problem. Um, most times it's just going to give it to you. They're going to give you a value here and you just plug in. Very unlikely, but could be that you would have to calculate the solute potential. Um, the solute potential is a function of C, which is the concentration of the solution, R is a pressure constant. Constant means it's always the same. So R is always going to have a value of 0 0.0831. And T is the temperature in Kelvin. Kelvin is a certain temperature scale we use a lot in chemistry. Um, if they give you a number in Celsius, you simply just add 273 to that to change it to Kelvin. The only semi-confusing difficult part, difficult like little number there is the I, the ionization constant. Um, so what happens is each solute particle. So if you have NaCl, so you have salt, you have sugar, whatever is dissolved, has a slightly different ionization constant. Um, they're usually whole numbers, and it's usually one or two. 
So um, if they don't give you the I, which a lot of times when I see these problems, I say, you know, the value of I is this. Just guess one. Um, salt has a ionization constant of one. I would just guess one and move on. Um, what's going to happen here, though, is the addition of solute lowers the solute potential and decreases the water potential, which kind of goes with what we talked about. The more solute there is, the less, you know, the, the higher the water concentration that's going to happen, and that's what you're going to see. So what I see a lot of with water potential is they'll give you actual numbers, values for that, and you just have to figure out which way the water is going to move. Um, don't forget it's always going to move from higher to lower. The only tricky part is water potential is negative, so you've got to remember like the whole number line thing. Number two, uh, negative two is less than negative one, um, but essentially you just figure out which, which number is higher and the water is going to move from high to low. And then don't forget, um, the concentration is going to be opposite. So it's going to move from high water to low water, but that also means it's going to move from low solute to high solute. Um, so you see here some of the pictures, right? Over here you have a lot of solute, so high solute concentration, low water concentration. Over here you have low water, I'm sorry, low solute, high water. So it's going to move, you know, in this direction. And we will do some practice problems with this as well. So if we do a little practice of which way is it going to move, um, I think asking yourself a series of questions sometimes helps with this, especially if you're getting confused about the high solute, low water. So question one says, which chamber has a lower water potential? So if you look, chamber A, right, has less solute than chamber B. So if chamber A has less solute, it has more water, and vice versa in chamber B more solute, less water. So which side's going to have the lower water potential? It's going to be chamber B, the side with less water. Two, which, which chamber has a lower solute potential? Um, that is going to be the one with lower solute, so it's A. And which direction will osmosis occur? It's going to move this way, A to B. Right? It's going to move from high water to low water. If one chamber has a water potential of negative 2,000 and the other negative 1,000, which, which is it that the chamber has the higher um, water potential? So again, we already figured out it's moving this way. Water moves from high to low. So A is going to be the higher value. And then as I mentioned before, don't forget that negative 2,000 is actually less than negative 1,000. So that means chamber A probably has a value of negative 1,000 and chamber B has a value of negative 2,000. Um, this application of water potential is also going to show you how transpiration occurs. So we talked about transpiration with capillary action and how the water climbs up the plant. Um, one of the other ways that this happens is with water potential. Um, so remember, water potential means that water is going to move from high to low. So if you look up at the top here, the water potential value at the top of the tree is negative 95. And at the bottom of the tree is negative 3. And you can see it kind of goes down, right, as you go up the tree. So Again, water moves from high water potential to low, so it's going to move from this 0.3 high end to the top where it is the low end. So that's one of the ways that transpiration works as well. So facilitated diffusion is anytime you're moving through a protein channel um, or a protein transmembrane protein. Basically, the protein is going to act as like a, a passageway or a bridge. It is still passive transport. No energy is required. You're still, quote unquote, glowing with the flow. You're moving from high to low concentration. The two main types of, of protein carriers and protein movements is a channel protein and a carrier protein. Um, the main difference is a channel protein is kind of like a tunnel. It's kind of always open. It's like a little passageway through. Um, it's going to be open on both ends, and, and the particles will move based on their concentration gradient, whereas a carrier protein is usually going to open and shut on one end. So a carrier protein is more like a drawbridge. So you see here... It's shut on the outside, but it's releasing on the inside, and then it would kind of move back and forth. Um, so that's the main difference. Uh, what happens is the interior part of the transmembrane protein in both cases is going to be hydrophilic. So that's what's going to allow things like water to move through the membrane. Remember, the particles on the inside of the membrane are hydrophobic. That's why water can't get through. So the interior of the transmembrane protein, however, is going to be hydrophilic. So it provides that kind of little passageway. Facilitated diffusion, of course, is going to move polar molecules. It moves a lot of ions. Um, it moves water. It moves glucose. Um, pretty much most things that are going to move into the cell are going to move facilitated diffusion. That's pretty much the most common movement method. 
And this is showing you the aquaporin, the water movement channel. It is a channel protein, so there's a little hole here, and here's the water molecules kind of moving through the interior where it's going to be hydrophilic. Um, again, the water's going to move based on the concentration of water. There is no kind of open and shut sides. Um, and I did want to remind you again that even though this looks like a kind of a chunky blue thing, that's not really what it looks like. It's a protein. So these pictures here are trying to show you kind of the 3D models of what it really looks like. And then don't forget the little squiggles are part of that protein folding, that alpha helic model. So what this kind of really is, it's a series of, of kind of helical proteins where the interior is going to be um, open so the water can move through. You're going to see, like, one of the things we're going to talk about is a lot of uh, organs are kind of very specific to what their function is. So your kidneys, the main job of your kidneys is to filter out liquid and, filter out and produce urine, basically. So your kidneys are going to have a ton of these aquaporins in it. So all throughout your kidneys here, because it's filtering water, are going to allow the water to move through back and forth through your kidneys. So you would expect to see a ton of aquaporins in your kidneys because of their, their, their function. An example of a carrier protein is how glucose moves through. Um, glucose is a little bit bigger of a molecule. Remember, it's a kind of a type of macromolecule. So a glucose is going to move through with a carrier. So again, you're going to think of a drawbridge. Um, instead of that open tunnel, you're going to have an open side and a closed side. So you see here the, the protein channel is open to the outside. The glucose comes in. It kind of turns and allows the glucose to kind of go inside the cell. Um, so it's a little bit different um, the way that the glucose um, protein is going to function. A lot of times down here, trying to show you there's, there's some um, receptors that are going to kind of key in, hey, we need some glucose, let's move some glucose in. Don't forget, this is still facilitated transport. This is not active transport yet. The glucose is small enough that it doesn't need that extra energy. It can just move in based on its concentration gradient. So a type of active transport, an exact example of active transport, would be something called an electrogenic pump. Um, the electrode kind of should give you some clue that the energy is involved, so it's active transport. So um, two main examples we're actually going to see a lot. We've actually talked a little bit about the sodium-potassium pump. Um, that's moving Na and K plus into and out of the cell. This is how a lot of your nerve um, transmissions are sent. This is how your heart beats. This is why your, you know, your dehydration and making sure your salt is where it needs to be. So you see here the ATP, right? The ATP is causing active transport to happen. Um, what really happens with the sodium-potassium pump, if you kind of look closely, is the sodium comes in and the, the, the potassium goes out. So it's kind of like a double pump in that way. Another one is called a proton pump. Um, this is going to push H plus ions across the membrane. We're going to see this a lot with photosynthesis and respiration. Um, notice in both these cases, we have charged ions, and that's going to be the key. Charged ions have to move kind of a little bit more particularly than other things because of that charge, because they carry that charge. They could damage the cell. So they have to move through the cell in a very particular way. Another thing that sometimes happens um, is something called co-transport. So that is where um, membrane proteins are going to kind of work together to kind of create an uphill and downhill kind of path for the solute particles to move. So the example here is showing you the proton pump working with sucrose transport transportation. So you can see the proton pump is active where it's pumping out. You can see it's against the gradient, right? Pro uh, pumping out the H pluses, but then as the H pluses come back in, so they kind of do a roundabout thing, the sucrose kind of hitches a ride. So co-transport is where a molecule, a particle is going to kind of hitch a ride on the movement of another particle, and it just helps it move it. It helps, again, with the cell efficiency. It makes things a little bit more efficient in the movement. So again, just a summary of passive and active transport. Um, the main difference is passive does not require energy because things move from high to low concentration. Think of it as like go with the flow. It's going where it's supposed to go. Um, and active transport does require energy because it's moving against the gradient. Think of it like paddling up river. Um, the types of passive transport are simple diffusion where something's just going to move right across the membrane. That would mo mostly be O2 and CO2. Facilitated diffusion is probably the most common transport type. It's still passive. It just requires a membrane protein, um, either a channel protein or a gated protein, because of that hydrophobic interior of the membrane. So this thing would be like aquaporins to move water, um, the way that glucose moves through the membrane. Those are all examples of facilitated diffusion. And then again, the key to active transport is you're going against the gradient. So you see here, it is less concentrated on the outside than inside. So you're kind of going against the current. You're going against the flow, and therefore you need energy to do that. 
Sometimes this whole process, especially osmosis, creates an issue, especially with animals that live in water. So if you live in water, um, you have a little bit more of an issue you know, maintaining the balance. So osmoregulation is when you try to control your solute and water balance, mainly for, for um, aquatic organisms. They have something a lot of times called a contractile vacuole. Sometimes you'll hear it with fish, it's called a fish bladder. What that does is it helps them pump out the extra water that they most likely will get in. So because you're living in water, you're going to be way more exposed to those hypertonic, hypotonic environments. So a lot of those aquatic species have what we call a contractile vacuole. So if that vacuole gets too full of fluid, it'll squeeze it out. So that's just the way that, you know, aquatic organisms kind of work to help control their water balance and it could be solute balance as well when they live in a water environment when they're kind of constantly exposed to the different concentrations of the water the last kind of movement and then this is like separate so we have active transport passive transport and then end bulk transport um, the word bulk should kind of tell you what this is this is when things are very 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 big so they're almost too big to go across the membrane in any way. They can't even do it through a membrane protein. They're just so big. So this is things like proteins. We talked about how big proteins were. Polysaccharides, very large molecules, macromolecules. They just can't go through the membrane. They're just too big. They physically won't be able to fit. So the way that they move is something called bulk transport. Um, endocytosis, endo meaning inside exocytosis, exo meaning outside. So endocytosis is big particles coming in. XO is big particles coming out. And they both kind of do something similar. They're, they're going to take advantage of things called vesicles. So remember, a vesicle is just a kind of membrane-surrounded sac. Um, so it is part of the, it does have membrane to it. So you see what happens with endocytosis is the particles kind of just lean into the membrane, the cell membrane, and they kind of just push, push, push in until the vesicle is going to pop out. So the, this vesicle actually has, you know, cell membrane around it. And kind of the opposite true is exocytosis. The vesicle is going to move towards the surface, and you see it kind of becomes part of the membrane, just opens up and releases. You can get a little bit more specific with bulk transport and talk about the two types of endocytosis. Endo meaning in. So phagocytosis is cellular eating. That's where you're going to move solids. And pinocytosis is cell drinking. That's where you're going to move fluids. Notice it's kind of the same process. The solid or the fluid kind of pushes down, almost like sitting on a trampoline, um, into the membrane, and it kind of then pops off this vesicle. And then those solid and liquid particles are going to go where they need to go. Um, Receptor-mediated endocytosis is kind of exactly what it sounds like. Um, it has what we call ligands or receptors on the surface that kind of signal the cell that, hey, this thing's coming. Um, it's going to coat it a little bit more. It's probably going to go to a very specific place on the cell. So it's almost like a special delivery, if you want to make sense. Um, it's, it's a package that you have to sign for to make sure that you get it. Um, it just kind of predates or, pre you know, before the, the particle is pushed in, it kind of has a signal to the cell that, hey, this is coming. This is a very special package, and that's what these ligand um, receptors are.